Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Dr. Nicole Prousey, PhD. She is an American neuroscientist who researches human sexual behavior, addiction, and the physiology behind sexual responses. Her work has been featured in Vice, Shape, Mike, The Daily Beast, among many others, and she has been referred to as Dr. Orgasm. Dr. Prousey, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So um, let's start at the beginning. Uh, How did you become interested in this line of work? I had no interest in this line of work (laughs) to begin with. I was just taking my undergrad classes in a liberal arts school and working on a psychological science degree, which is like the the science-y part of psychology, and had to take a lab credit. And I looked down the course catalog at Indiana University, and I was like, Kinsey Institute? I got to do that. (laughs) And so I went to the uh, Kinsey Institute that's well known for its research in sex, gender, and reproduction. And my very first study there was monitoring the vaginal responses of older adult women to uh, pornography that was appropriate for them (laughs) and looking at whether the pills they were taking impacted their sexual response. And I thought it was amazing that you could study something and make it that concrete in that space. I was sold. I had no idea it was even a job that you could have until I took that class. And ever since then, I've been specializing in sexual physiology. So kind of the connection of uh, what we're experiencing during sex and what our body's doing. Wow. So you said, um, you know, uh, responses in older women for porn that was um, appropriate for them. Like, was there a difference depending on the woman that you studied or was it across the board? Did they like the same kind of stuff? In the lab, we have really funny protocols for selecting our porn. You know, we're always nonprofit, so we just use it um, based on selections from pre-testing. Usually the porn that we um, use in laboratory studies uh, has one man and one woman engaged in consensual vaginal intercourse with no low base rate behaviors. So that would be low base rate is things that are done less frequently. So um, BDSM, while some people might really enjoy that content, um, a lot of people don't uh, like actively dislike it or they just aren't that interested. So we put super vanilla stuff uh, on that we think is going to be relevant for most folks. And in the case of these older adult women, we wanted to show them people who looked uh, at least somewhat like them so that they might be able to identify with the characters. Uh, Because in those laboratory settings, our main goal is to provoke a sexual response that we can then monitor and quantify. So we just want you aroused. (laughs) However, we can get that to systematically happen. And we don't get to get very creative with what we pick because of that. Interesting. Had, were any of these women, um, did they, any of them say that they had like never seen porn before? I didn't hear any women say that specifically. Um, some definitely commented just spontaneously on what they saw. They're like, well, but it's more that like, well, that was interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Part of the weirdness of the interaction, um, you know, there are very few scientists that study in this space and show people porn in the lab, uh, is we're also trying to maintain good boundaries, you know, like to not right. suggest to our research participants that we should have a conversation about what they just saw. So we have these weird kind of rules where we don't really engage with them to talk about the content of what they saw. We don't want to influence their responses or make them feel ashamed or excited about anything. So it's a weird type of structure where with a friend, I would totally have that conversation. But with a research participant, oh, okay, next. (laughs) So I I didn't get much more out of them than just some of these spontaneous like, well, that was interesting. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, this is so interesting to me because, you know, so many people say that women don't watch porn, don't enjoy porn. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, what was the environment like? I assume they were probably like in a private room. You guys like weren't in there watching them, right? (laughs) That's a common misperception. We do not stay in the room with them. We always leave the room. They're in a private space. Um, We always have cable tunnels. So we just run our cords through the wall uh, so that they can be in private. And then we talk to them through... um, you know, some type of mic uh, speaker system so that we can still keep a handle on, you know, are you able to see the screen okay? You know, do you have any questions before we start? The instruments that they have, like to measure their vaginal response, they can place themselves. We try and make the room look a little bit like home. So the Kinsey Institute actually had a really nice space that had like a roll a rollover desk and this bookshelves. 
uh, <laughs> really designed to look like a home, like regular curtains on the wall instead of the uh, ones we had out in the hallway, because we want you to be able to respond. And one of the best replicated findings in our science is we often will find that women are having a vaginal response to pornography that we show them. But if we ask them, how sexually aroused do you feel by that film? Um, they'll say they're not aroused. And we say, well, but your body's responding. And so a lot of our research is around exactly that question. Like, why do these two things not match up? That's so interesting. So do you think that the women really thought they weren't aroused? Or do you think they were ashamed to admit it because of the stigma around porn? I think it's more the former is my sense, because we've also done tasks where we say, okay, this is exactly what that thing measures. Can you just try to move this indicator the way you think your vagina is responding? Like, just try and give me that measure. Um, and they're, they're a little bit closer when we ask them to do that, but not much. So my sense is part of it is like we're me measuring essentially, uh, we call it vaginal vasocongestion, which just means the blood that's in the vaginal walls. Um, that happens with sexual arousal and people aren't used to monitoring that. <laughs> like it's not something they yeah. necessarily attend to. Like if you looked at your vulva, you would kind of have to know what you were looking for uh, to know that that was happening. So I think it's a combination of like, it's an instrumentation thing and just not being used to monitoring or thinking about arousal in that way. Um, so I, I don't think it's just a shame thing. At least it may be like baked into that judgment, but it's something we just see very reliably for women. Yeah, I guess I, th I feel like women are kind of trained to just believe that they would never enjoy or be responsive to porn. And it's a it's a plague that affects like men only. And, you know, women are always battling um, their husbands or their boyfriends becoming yeah. addicted to porn or, or one of those other buzzwords. Yeah, this is definitely the data are behind you on that. When we look at people who are enrolled in like these inpatient porn addiction programs, they're all men. And yeah. so people will say, oh, well, women suffer too. And we're like, well, all the data say <laughs> almost universally, like women tend to report positive impacts from viewing pornography. That is like the more pornography they view, they report higher sex drive, more consistent orgasms, higher relationship satisfaction, higher sexual satisfaction across so many labs at this point <laughs> that I'm going to say it's a reliable effect. Um, wow. And yet when we talk about the effects of porn, we say, oh, there are all these negatives. And we're like, well, sure, if you ignore women, <laughs> we can talk about some negative issues and we can you know, understand how those come about and what that's related to. But I think it's hysterical that literally to have that discussion and claim all these negative effects, you have to ignore that women exist. And that's... Right a lot of these arguments are doing to, to make the strong claims that they're making to ignore the female data. So I, I want to talk about um, your research about sex addiction, because, you know, that is something that we see thrown around a lot. And there's a lot of controversy over whether or not sex addiction is a real thing, whether or not porn addiction is a real thing. What have your um, studies found? We don't have any doubt that some people struggle with viewing more porn than they mean to. I don't think anyone's debating that. Um, I'm also a clinician. And so I have patients come in and say, like, I'm viewing more porn than I want to. Like, they're, they're real. They're not just a secondary gain motive. You know, um, clearly there are some famous cases where people seem to blame sex or porn addiction to get out of something they did wrong. You know, they're actually a sex offender and they, they try and blame it on that. Um, those certainly exist. But I think the vast majority of people who come in, you know, like, they're really concerned. They're worried, like, what does this mean about me or who I am? And uh, so we try and understand as clinical scientists, like, what do we do with these people? You know, how do we help? What's most likely causing that? And the data so far overwhelmingly suggests that it's a conservative or religious upbringing. So that is, you have shame around your viewing. And uh, that's very different from addiction. <laughs> you know, we've tested a lot of the components that are necessary to call something an addiction and porn fails in many ways. Uh, it just doesn't look like other substances or even behavioral addictions. Uh, so I feel very confident saying that it doesn't, it's not addictive, but that doesn't mean it's not a problem for some people or that we don't help them. It's just, we need to help in a different way. So the uh, best example I know is there's a treatment called acceptance and commitment therapy um, for people who are struggling with porn. And the way that uh, that approach, that ACT, we abbreviated approach is not to say stop porn. It's to say, okay, you're struggling with it. 
let's talk about that. You know, where did you first learn about sexuality? Where did you get the message that porn is bad? In what ways do you think it's bad? Are there benefits for you? You know, how do you see this fitting into your life? And it kind of works through like what your values are around that and how you want it to be present in your life, if at all you know, what that might look like. And that's such a more balanced approach, you know, to almost educational to say like, you know, a lot of people watch without issue. Why do we think this is different for you? You know, let's help walk through what that looks like and how you want porn to be in your life, if at all. So there are great treatments to help people with this issue. And I think it's really a shame that, you know, we're foisting a label that's not appropriate, that doesn't fit uh, so that people, I think, can make money by sending people to inpatient programs that are really expensive. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what would you what would you classify as like a porn problem? So, um, like, how much porn does one have to watch in a day? Like, what are the markers that you would say, okay, yes, you you do have a not an addiction, mm-hmm. but a problem with porn, and you are watching too much, like. Because I know that there's probably a lot of guys who are watching this thinking, well, I might have a problem, but like what, you know, what would that look like? Mm -hmm. We, a lot of labs have tried to define problems quantitatively. So either by the amount watched, like, you know, how many average minutes do you watch in a week? And we'll try and like plot when people start to say this is a problem. Um, Some older studies have looked at orgasms. So like how many orgasms in a week is too many, <laughs> you know, like, is there a point at which you're like, all right, all right, you know, that's um, now interfering. And those studies generally aren't very predictive. Like they don't, um, they're not able to predict when people feel upset about their use or when they're having problems in their life. So a lot of what we really base that around is distress, mm-hmm. you know, so uh, distress often arises when you're doing something that interferes with other goals in your life. So I think television viewing is a great parallel to this. That is, people sometimes watch too much television. And if you watch enough and maybe you're not getting up and exercising and you're having uh, some trouble meeting your exercise goals and you feel bad about yourself, I was like, well, let's reduce your television viewing then in favor of some more activity. Let's figure out how to do that. So uh, that's what I would look for in people who feel like they're viewing too much, um, you are masturbating too much as it may be. It's like, well, what what are you neglecting that you want to be doing that's valuable to your life? You know, what is that trade off? So, you know, if you're watching a fair amount of porn, but it fits in your lifestyle, you know, and you're, you're able to manage your work and um, you're responsive to your partner, partners, if you have them, your kids, if you have child responsibilities, then I'm really hard pressed to say, I'm going to tell you you have a problem, even though you don't feel like you do. That's such an interesting parallel that you brought up TV watching, because I think Mm -hmm. that it's a lot of people watch way too much TV, but we don't really talk about TV addiction, do we? It's strange. There was a big push for it when TV was becoming popularized. It seemed Mm -hmm. like it was headed that direction. And now there are these great interventions. They're mainly for kids, but um, to help reduce television viewing, just because it's associated with some negative things that, you know, obesity being the main one for kiddos, um, that of course, like that makes sense to want to reduce that. So let's just make it more balanced. We don't say don't watch television ever again. We're like, you're just watching too much for the other things you want to be doing with your life. So how can we balance that out? And that's what those television interventions do. So I'd love to see that kind of implemented with porn, where if you feel like, okay, I'm now watching enough that like, partner is getting upset because I'm not helping with childcare at night because I'm like engaged in all this. And yeah, yeah. that's probably a problem. <laughs> we, should, we should probably help you watch less. Where, what resources could people look for if, if they feel that they might have a problem? So there's uh, that acceptance and commitment therapy approach is something that most uh, newer clinicians are trained in. So you can seek out therapy, but I know for a lot of folks, therapy is not reasonable either financially or <laughs> insurance wise. Thank you, US uh, healthcare. So uh, there have been some programs like Cameron Staley um, what, did some of this early research in this space and has tried to implement that ACT program in like a self help series of videos. Um, and I think he's char- he is charging something for it, but it's relatively low, um, certainly compared to like doing that program. So that's one possibility, you know, is trying to go through, if you want to be systematic about it, like see what Dr. Steely has um, that's trying to implement some of these ACT principles for 
uh, people to guide themselves through. And self-guided, um, there are also some groups, depending on where you live. Um, Utah has quite a lot of them <laughs> because they have a lot of concerns there where they're actually trying to implement those ACT principles in a group setting. So while there may be some uh, concerns around sharing those issues that you have with a group, you know, other people, um, those can make it a lot more affordable. It can feel good, you know, to kind of hear other people share about the struggles that they're having. And also just to talk about those values issues with another person, like, why do I feel this bad about porn? Like, this seems disproportionate <laughs> to what it's actually right. doing. Um, you know, maybe this person uh, was raised the same way I was. I, you know, or had the same kind of father that I had. And so those group settings can be helpful, I think, also if um, if there's a concern of like, you know, how do I afford this? You know, I want to get that uh, good intervention that when we have evidence works and is helpful, um, but I don't have access to a therapist or don't want to go to one, or maybe you don't want to talk to anyone. So I think there are options now, but we're definitely working on like, uh, we call that dissemination. So once we have a treatment that we know is helpful, we got to get it out to you. <laughs> so, right. so we're trying, <laughs> you know, that's uh, certainly therapists. Some groups uh, have it now. And then there's this video program that one person's worked on. Yeah. I mean, you talk about trying to get that information out to people. That's definitely not something that you see covered in the mainstream media. Yeah. Instead, you see stories like the recent Billie Eilish interview with Howard mm -hmm. Stern, where she said she started watching porn at 11 and she thinks it warped her relationship with sex and that it destroyed her brain. Um, what did you think about that when that came out? And like how, you know, because obviously this ties into, you know, like a problem that we do have with minors um, accessing porn. Like how, mm -hmm. how do we tackle this issue and how much of an issue is it? So I do think, uh, especially in the U.S., we are notorious among countries that are most comparable to us for having bad sex ed. I mean, just yeah. we're, we are literally known in the research community for Americans have bad sex education. So I think we are largely promoting kids looking at porn, even though it's illegal here, <laughs> because they're not getting that information anywhere else. And it's insane. You know, that, that to me is kind of the most obvious connection. But what really worried me about Eilish's comments uh, were kind of two pieces of it. One is that it destroys your brain. It does not destroy your brain. There is no evidence that that happens. Um, the studies that people sometimes refer to um, where there are associations between differences in brains of people who watch more porn and watch less porn, those weren't randomly assigned. So if you want to demonstrate that porn has caused an effect, you need to randomly assign people to consistently view porn over time <laughs> so have a pool that hasn't seen it and say, you know, you five are going to do this, you five are going to do that. Look at them a year later and then relate those brain changes to the pornography that they viewed. That's never been done. And I can't imagine doing that study. It'd be a hard one to do. And so what's more likely is people who view porn tend to have a lot of other characteristics on average, right? This isn't everyone clearly, but people who view yeah. more porn... Uh, they tend to be a little more impulsive. They tend to be a little more pleasure seeking. They're somewhat more likely uh, to take recreational drugs. I was like, right there, all of those are also causing brain differences. And so we have no way to associate what's been blamed on porn with actually being related to the porn that's being viewed. And the scientists say that in their studies, they're very clear about it. They say, you know, this is not evidence that porn has caused these differences. But of course, people who want to promote that idea ignore that and say there's overwhelming evidence. I say not only is there not overwhelming evidence, there's not, no evidence <laughs> that it causes this. So Billie Eilish's statements were really false. Um, you know, there, there's not evidence that that happened. Uh, she presented no fMRIs of herself pre-post that might provide evidence that that had happened to her. I understand she had a negative experience, and I don't think we're here to debate that. I, I don't know her, <laughs> so I, I don't know what her situation is. Uh, but then the second piece of that that concerned me was her claim about the body as being unreal or unrealistic. So uh, science has studied the impact of viewing pornography on self-concept um, for decades. This is not a new area of research for us. And earlier on, that was true. Uh, that is, people who viewed more porn, especially women, tended to have more negative body image issues. Um, but now we've actually seen a shift where the more vulvas that someone has viewed, uh, the more positive they are about their own bodies. 
And I think that shift is largely due to the change in the nature of porn. That is, we used to have, uh, I believe, and you can <laughs> correct me here, but my understanding of the industry is like, we used to have more individual studios that were selecting and had people on payroll um, that had specific body types. And now it's so democratized with all of the different uh, camming and uh, OnlyFans and equivalent kinds of things that if they're, if you know, you're looking at porn, you will find your body represented somewhere. You know, so if you feel like your labia are too long or your chest is weird looking, you will probably find someone who has that and is attractive to another person in pornography somewhere. So my sense is just like the nature of porn has changed a lot. So where it used to have that because we said, you know, these are the only bodies. Now it's like everybody can be attractive to somebody. And with that strong message out there, I think Eilish is just wrong. You know, the that kind of cookie cutter body that may have existed decades ago in pornography is just not the case anymore. You really hit the nail on the head there because, yeah, from my 23 years in the industry, I can tell you that is absolutely true. There's been a huge shift in the kind of bodies that we're seeing represented in adult now because you're right. I mean, really, you know, I came along, I started working for my parents in the industry right on like the cusp of like the internet becoming, mm -hmm. you know, popular. And uh, before that, the, the method of distribution was very much, you know, between like a small pool of people. And so in order for a um, actress to be hired, you know, to do a movie, um, she had to be like approved by, you know, there's the distributor and then there's the producer and then there's director. So there's, there's all of these people who decide, you know, kind of who's attractive and, and who's not. Um, okay. and, and yeah, there was a very much a cookie cutter look. And then when the internet came along, I really feel like it gave people the ability to seek out what they wanted and mm -hmm. surprise, surprise, not everybody wants to see that cookie cutter, you know, blonde, skinny woman with big tits. Like there's all different kinds of body types, um, gender identifications that, that people are interested in. And so, like you said, democratizes, I think that the internet really did that camming really did that. And the inclusivity that I see now in the adult industry is just so it's like night and day from when I first started and it's mm -hmm. wonderful. And for me, you know, as a woman who started in the industry when I was 20, I'm now 43. And, you know, I think like most women, um, in this world, especially in America, like I have, you know, my body issues. I don't, I, there's things I would like to change and there's things I'm unhappy with. And now, when I'm actually at like my heaviest I've ever been my whole life after having a kid, I'm like happier with my body now than I've ever been. And I can attest that so much of that comes from porn and comes from like the different people that I see being showcased on um, the different people that I've interviewed in my podcast. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I look at women like Carla Lane, who's like a BBW performer who absolutely loves her body and is so confident in how she looks. And you know, I, I think things like, well, if she loves how she looks, like, why can't I love how I look? And, um, yeah, I mean, I've felt a personal difference in how I see myself. So, uh, I think you're absolutely right in that sense. And it was funny too, because, you know, the one thing that, that Billie Eilish specifically referenced was like women's vaginas, you know, they're like, oh, they all look the same and no women's vaginas look like that. And they've all had labiaplasty. And you see all of these really popular performers who have like bigger lips, who don't have that, that, you know, tiny lip labiaplasty look that Eilish thinks everybody has like Alina Lopez and like Abigail Mack going, wait, wait, wait a minute. Have you seen my vagina? Like what porn are you looking at? Yeah, like, we all look different. When you're on a tirade, like it sounded like she was, it just, you know, you're just piling on and not thinking about like, is what I'm saying actually true? Like if I stopped and thought about this statement, is that really true? And I think, uh, you know, one of the other, to the kind of democratization ideas that um, we think about, especially in the US, there've been a couple of studies now looking at LGBT youth, uh, especially that are in rural areas where like, you know, we live in Los Angeles. So if you go to West Hollywood, you will see gay representation. <laughs> you can't mm -hmm. miss yeah. them. But, um, you know, if you live somewhere, maybe in rural Montana, uh, there are these studies showing now that these kids that don't 
uh, have access to community. So that is other gay adult males who are good role models for them, but are concerned they might be homosexual. You know, they're trying to sort things out. When they see that representation, they'll say, I saw it in porn and I realized other people liked what I liked. Like there were adults who did this. And that's not really the way I would prefer youth, you know, kind of learn about maybe their orientation or explore it. I'd rather they could have good adults to talk with about that. But that is another way that I think porn sometimes when youth view it is not this universal harm. That is, they're also realizing like homosexuality is not an evil thing. I'm not maybe going to hell. Maybe, you know, there's life outside of my immediate community and I'm going to be okay. And some of the studies have shown youth talking about LGBT youth, especially talking about pornography in that way. Like I saw what I preferred represented and realized I wasn't alone. And that can right. be a really powerful thing to see. I think also there's a problem with like media literacy around porn, because when people think about porn, most people think about like this, just this one type of porn, right? Like porn is all the same. Mm -hmm. um, porn represents women in, you know, all the same ways, all women are degraded and exploited in porn when really porn is so many different things. And you can find porn that would appeal to whatever your tastes are. I mean, there's a lot of like, you know, female centric, like what we would call, you know, feminist porn um, that represents real women, real bodies and, you know, women in, in power and in charge. So, uh, but there's no really, you know, the media doesn't push that. Um, they're just like, oh, porn, it's all this one thing. So it's like, okay, if I'm somebody who doesn't know anything about porn, where do I go to find the porn that I like? Like Pornhub, mm -hmm. you know, everything that's featured on the front page is kind of that more, usually that more generic type porn that, that everybody else is viewing. But if you have specific tastes, like there's no, like there's no information um, that the mainstream media gives people as to like, Oh, mm -hmm. do you want to see like queer porn? Um, you know, people of color, like this is where you can go to view that, that kind of stuff. It's just, it's all like, I don't know. And I don't know how to get that information out to people. It's funny. It's just, yeah, it's not a great headline. So we, you know, people were concerned at one time about this escalation idea. That is if you view uh, pornography, you're going to view more and more extreme stuff over time. And Ultimately, you know, there are even some therapists who we found were telling people, if you continue to view porn, you will eventually sexually molest your children. Like that's where it ends up, which is insane. Are There's nothing that's joke that that's the case. Insane. Yeah. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of work to try and like heal patients who were handled by these bad therapists. But, um, but even like before that, <laughs> so people have followed just like what content they're looking at over time and they'll do a survey and then ask them three months later, ask them six months later. And what I thought was really interesting in the survey, a large survey out of Croatia, was they saw uh, these guys, boys, they're on the young end, who would look at BDSM content um, and say, well, what about three months later is a very strong trend to go back to the vanilla stuff. So they would look at it and they'd have an interest and they'd look at that stuff for a while and then they'd go back to you know, one man, one woman, still the most popular genre. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And same thing, like if you look at content of porn, when we content analyze it, the overwhelming majority of search and the websites themselves probably have more data on search than we do, you know, looking, uh, mm -hmm. trying to scrape from the outside as scientists. But, um, but overwhelmingly, the content that's searched for tends to be romantic, you know, <laughs> heterosexual straight stuff. People in general are looking at very vanilla things. And so uh, even when they look at this other content, they tend to come back to uh, this more kind of vanilla content. That we don't see evidence for this escalation that people kind of go off go off the deep end and end up looking at um, maybe bestiality or something like that but i am very curious and maybe you have an impression of this even because uh, people ask me sometimes like well why even look at that you know what are they why are they looking at you know a woman and a and a horse um sorry to pick on that if that's yeah. somebody's thing <laughs> uh, you know so i like i always wonder with that if um that may be less about sexual arousal and more like looking at YouTube videos of weird things, you know, like at some point, is it no longer porn? And they're almost just like, I just want to see that. I'm not that into yeah. it, but I saw the link and I want to click on it just to see it. Um, but I don't know how that works. Like how does some of that stuff even become in the content to begin with? Well, I mean, I think we can look at the, um, you know, the popularity of two girls, one cup. Like, I don't think 
anybody well, who watched yeah. that <laughs> was actually like jerking off to it. I think most people, I mean, they did that whole, um, I don't know if you ever saw it, but they did that whole like reaction video compilation of people watching that and everybody um, was like gagging and like, so I think, yeah, I think it's kind of the same thing as when you drive by a really bad car accident, you slow down and like you look, I mean, yeah. you know, we're kind of fascinated by, um, the strange and the disgusting and the morbid. So I think there's definitely a lot of curiosity that comes into play there. Mm -hmm. That's where I feel, yeah, some people that bring up these extreme videos is I wonder, like, are people even viewing those videos in the same way they're viewing some of this other content? And I have not seen any research on that. Like, I'd be really curious. So we have ways of, like, extracting your emotional responses without asking you. <laughs> so there's, mm -hmm. like, a technique called the startle eye blink response where we can look at your physiology and kind of tell if you're having a, a negative or a positive response to something. And I bet, you know, if I showed people those kind of videos and looked at their affective responses, they would be like, this is terrible, <laughs> you know, but, yeah. but here I am watching it, you know, it's the same way you mentioned the car accidents. I love that example. It's like, I don't really want to think of myself as someone who looks for dead bodies. And yet here I'm looking to see what happened in this accident. Why would I look at that? What does that say about me? <laughs> you know? Yeah. So it's a really interesting kind of uh, problem. Like what? why are people looking at that? And I'd love to know more about that. I haven't seen science on that. Yeah. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we are going to, talk, I'm so excited about this. We're going to talk about Dr. Prowsey's uh, study of women penis size preferences. So um, there is going to be a scientific study that we're going to talk about that's going to make you finally, hopefully come to terms with the fact that your penis is just perfect the way it is. So hang tight guys. We'll be right back. Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q and A's, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Okay. So you have studied women's penis size preferences. This is, uh, some, this is uh, something that needs to be, you know, studied and it's been debated and it's like the number one question I get from men all the time. Like, is my penis okay? Mm -hmm. Is it too small? Um, so what were your findings and can you tell us a little bit more about the study and how you conducted it? There have been a lot of studies on penis size preferences in women. And to that point, we uh, mainly had studies that were like on a sheet of paper and they would ask women, well, how many inches long do you prefer? And I thought, well, that's kind of hard to answer. <laughs> like, not only is it a little abstract, but we're also as humans bad at estimating size. You know, so if I ask you to like, show me what five inches is, how close would you really get? I don't know. And so we thought we need to be more concrete about this and create uh, what are known in our biz as haptic stimuli. That is something you can hold and look at. So we decided we were going to print a variety of penis sizes um, to represent, I think it was 33 different models we ended up with. And we 3D printed them. Uh, we made them blue so that they wouldn't you know, reflect any particular race, we hoped. Uh, no one's really blue and asked a series of women to come into the lab and pick out the penis that they'd had, you know, the most experience with recently and their biggest and the smallest. And then also uh, what penis they would prefer for a one-time partner and what penis they would prefer for a long-term partner. And that last, uh, those last two questions were what we ended up publishing on. So the women tended to pick out a penis that was slightly larger for a one-time partner, especially in girth and a bit uh, smaller for a long-term partner. And my collaborator is an evolutionary psychologist, so he's really interested in these ideas of like how mating strategies, you know, um, are integrated into those kind of things. So the the joke was that we had discovered husband dick. That is, you know, what the uh, what women may want for a one time or a pleasure fun side thing um, appears to be bigger than what they're really wanting to maybe deal with on a day to day basis. <laughs> That's um, maybe a bit smaller. Yeah, we call it uh, we call it boyfriend boyfriend dick. 
<laughs> and I've, I've interviewed quite a few girls about this and uh, they've said, yeah, you know, like boyfriend dick size. But I just want to actually specifically um, reference the, the, the measurement numbers that you came up with because, you know, like everyone's going to want to know, well, okay, well, what is this? So it, um, mm-hmm. you said that for the boyfriend or husband dick, um, it was generally six and a half feet long and uh, five feet. Wow. Six and 6.4 inches long <laughs> and five inches around. And then um, for dating, um, it was, oh, wow, an ad just popped up while I'm trying to look at this. That's not nice. Um, it was uh, 6.3 inches long and 4.8 around. Does that sound correct? Sounds about right. I, it's been a while, but honestly, anyone could look at this. It happens to be a journal article that's available free on the internet. Not all of them are, but uh, it's just called Women's Preferences for Penis Size, a new research method using selection among 3D models. So you can even go look at the, the plot themselves if you want to, to see exactly like where normal falls and where the preferences were. Yeah. I mean, I think most guys, you know, assume that women are interested in like eight inches, seven inches, and, Mm -hmm. and these fall well below that. And I think the average is, is five and a half, like worldwide. Is that, is that correct? You know, it, it is, but our, oddly, our measures of penis size are really poor because, uh, we kind of, again, have these weird rules in research where we can't be in the presence of an erect penis that was caused by sexual arousal. So, so most of these are self measures, which I assume there's some exaggeration going on or inaccuracy, we'll give them credit. Um, and so the only ones where we have actual physicians measuring or researchers measuring um, are when they've been in, uh, induced with paprovin. So you inject the penis with something that causes it to become erect. And I don't know if that size is the same as what is produced by natural sexual arousal. Um, because this drug is was designed you know, to create um, maximal relaxation in the penile muscles that allows this blood to come in. So, uh, so those few studies we have where they were actually measured by someone not themselves, uh, hopefully right. in a more systematic way, were also paprovin induced. So I don't know that we really have great measures of what is normal. Hopefully they're somewhere around there, but I, I would never uh, take those as too gospel either. You know, we're still working yeah. on the Yeah. And I think also penis size can appear different on different men, depending on like what the rest of their body looks like, you know, if they're heavier or they're thinner or if they've like Mm -hmm. shaved their bush or not, you know, I mean, there's a lot of factors there. And we asked explicitly, uh, also of these women, we said of these different traits, you know, which one is, which ones are more or less important to you, please rank order. And I think uh, penis size was towards the bottom of these 12 traits, like, I think it was just above eye color and type of car or something. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really low on the ranking. So it's not that women don't consider it. It's in there somewhere. And probably if you're at one extreme or the other, maybe it's more relevant. Um, mm-hmm. more but it's just not something I understand. The guys care a lot. <laughs> it's, on average, women tend to value it pretty lowly in terms of judging yeah. how much they like a person. I think also, too, because the men that contact me, um, with their concerns about their penis size are generally men who watch a lot of porn, right? Because otherwise, how would you know who I was? Mm -hmm. And in porn, you know, we see these larger size penises because porn is, you know, a fantasy and it's kind of a caricature of, you know, real, real people generally. And so, you know, and for logistical reasons, which I've explained, um, many times, uh, the penis size has to be bigger for us to be able to capture it on film in a way where it's still, um, inside the, uh, other person, but also like long enough so that, um, there's space between the bodies so we can see the insertion mm-hmm. and see the penis at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's cause guys have to do something that we call opening up where they have to kind of like open their hips up to the camera. And so that naturally will kind of like, you know, take the penis out a little bit, right? Because you've got to kind of pull back. Um, and so like, just for those reasons specifically, like it's, it's much easier to shoot guys with bigger penises because it's so much easier to photograph and, and film. Yeah, but it doesn't practical. necessarily. <laughs> it is, yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that that's what 
women like. So I think that I think that porn does paint this this picture of these unrealistic body proportions in women too, you know. Um, well, I, also, we had a we did a demo with these products, you know. So we hauled our penises out into a group at one point for a demonstration we were filming and. They said, okay, you know, pick the average penis size in pornography, you know, and they picked up whatever they thought that was. Okay, now pick what you think the average penis size is of men, you know, in this uh, country or in the UK at the time. And of course they picked a smaller one. So I would also point out like, people know that this is fantasy. They are aware yeah. that these are unusually large penises. They're not. So one thing that always cracks me up when they say, oh, well, you know, porn is deceptive or it's misleading. I was like, do you think people are stupid? <laughs> like they're, they're very well aware that this is entertainment and that these people um, are selected for some characteristics and penis size I think being a well-known one. <laughs> you know, these, the folks in our demonstration could easily pick out, you know, that uh, the pornography penis was different than the average size penis. Yeah. But I think it still plays into like people's insecurities and because, you know, you look at women who look at fashion models and think I should look mm -hmm. like that, knowing that that is not what most people look like, but it's like, mm -hmm. you know, and even myself, um, you know, as somebody who I, I feel like can decipher between fantasy and reality, you know, I'll see like a, a model with a perfect body and, mm -hmm. and I, it, it, even in a finished photograph, right. That I've retouched myself and I've shot her for her best angles and I've made sure that I shot her in a way where she looked like the thinnest here and the thinnest there. Mm -hmm. But like some part of my lizard brain, even though intellectually I know that she doesn't always look like that and that mm -hmm. there have been things that I have done to make her look that way. Um, there's still some part of my lizard brain, which is like, you should look like that all the time. So I don't know. I feel like yeah. sometimes we just can't help. I think that there are exactly some researchers now who are uh, measuring people's porn realism. So like the extent to which you believe porn reflects real life. And that's a regular mediator, you know, that is to the extent that you think that is the case. Um, so you say, you know, I still have a lizard brain and uh, have trouble differentiating. And to the extent you can shut those things down, you know, and some people can better than others, it clearly uh, varies, then you're going to be less affected by it. So. Mm -hmm. That's another uh, great like porn literacy kind of point that is, uh, you know, how do we, knowing that these things are different, integrate that <laughs> in our understanding so that it doesn't uh, lead to insecurity in those places where there are differences. You know, like, I know that this is different. I know that this is larger than is typical and I don't need that. How can I keep telling myself that and make myself believe it? You know, it's the same kind of thing we do in anxiety disorders. Like you, you know that some negative outcome is unlikely to happen. You're probably not going to be fired tomorrow. You know, this is probably not that big of a mistake. Uh, but how do you convince yourself so that you can like have a day and do the things you need to do to get on with your day? Uh, it's tough. You know, that's, uh, that's a skill that can be taught. I think that that idea of porn realism is certainly varies a lot in different people. Do you think that people have these, you know, cause I definitely am somebody who's like a worst case scenario kind of person. Oh, yeah. Do you think that that's just an evolutionary, um, tactic that's like kind of built into us because, you know, we used to be in situations where, you know, every day was kind of like a matter of life and death and like these mm -hmm. things might kill you. And so like, we're kind of, tr it's like ingrained in us to imagine worst case scenario because then we try to figure ways to get out of it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, this, if you like this kind of thing, you got to Google Yerkes Dodson. <laughs> so this is okay. the curve that's basically like, we need some level of anxiety. It's useful. It makes sure that we get up and do things and go to work and <laughs> you know, make sure we uh, have enough money to get food for tomorrow and all of those kind of things that we need to survive. But for a lot of people, it kind of tips over. And so that curve is about, you know, how do you stay in that sweet spot? Like I need some anxiety to motivate my day to make sure I do things well. Um, but if it gets to be too much, you know, then I become overwhelmed and I may shut down or do nothing. And if it's too little, then I don't take care of my needs you know, or my partner's needs. And so we, we're often trying to get people kind of in that sweet spot on that curve. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like that's just like the eternal struggle, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> trying to find that middle road. Uh, you also uh, co-authored the first study on orgasmic meditation. Can you explain what that is? And is there any similarity between that and like tantric sex? 
The practice itself of orgasmic meditation, the core of it is 15 minutes of manual genital clitoral stroking. So this is a woman lying down with uh, generally undressed from the waist down or skirt up and the partner, male, female, whomever beside her sitting upright and they're putting their finger just beside the clitoral shaft and stroking very, very, very slowly for 15 minutes. And the goal is just to feel. So they're not actually trying to have an orgasm despite the name. <laughs> and the uh, groups that do this claim a variety of health benefits from it. So, you know, they say that they they may feel more centered or help with their depression or anxiety. And our studies in uh, orgasmic meditation are largely about testing some of those claims. So this is a great protocol for a lab. You know, it's really, really hard um, to, uh, hard <laughs> to study, <laughs> sorry, um, to study two people interacting in the lab because we can't just bring them in and say, okay, y'all have sex and then we're going to study it. Because <laughs> what is having sex? Like we're going to yeah. get, you know, for every couple that comes in, there'll be something different. In a lab, we have to have a controlled setting. Like we have to have certain things happen at certain times so that we can know uh, with timestamps where in your brain, you know, that happened. And um, so we brought these couples in who knew how to do orgasmic meditation uh, to do this while we recorded brainwaves from both people. And then we got some additional measures on the person doing the stimulation. We measured their arm movements using electromyography, these eight uh, metal plates around their forearm. And in the person receiving the stimulation, we also got uh, their heart rate and something called galvanic skin response. It's just like micro sweat. And so we've been publishing the behavioral data, which is just them telling us how they felt. Um, the data we have coming out next are about the brainwave <laughs> data. And then ultimately we wanna integrate those so some of the things we found, this is like the most obvious science in the world, but there's a reason <laughs> for it. So people, after they do genital stroking, they feel closer to one another. <laughs> that was literally the first paper. And you may say, well, like, no kidding. You know, you needed science for that. And I totally get that. But that's actually really debated. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Um, that is, there are a lot of therapists included who believe if you have some kind of a genital interaction with somebody who's not your romantic partner, that that can't be healthy, that it's promiscuous or it's wasted or like they use all this terrible language around it. And so we said, just to start out, we just have to demonstrate that people had a positive experience <laughs> doing this. So we just looked at their like reports before and after, depending on if the partner they came in with were their regular romantic partner or just somebody else. And it turns out like the somebody else had just as many benefits and more in some cases. So uh, that's what we're continuing to do work on now is like, okay, you know, what, what other claims have they made and can we document those? You know, how can we show that in the physiology and also in the experience? That brings up a, a question that I actually wasn't, I hadn't even thought about until just now. I remember a friend of mine telling me that when women orgasm, they release a certain chemical that creates like it's like bonding. It's, I think it's like the same chemical that supposedly is um, created between like a mother and child. Like there's mm -hmm. that, there's that chemical. Is that, is that true? The oxytocin has more changes with sexual arousal, actually not with climax. Uh, the bigger okay. change when you have a climax is in vasopressin. Uh, and just to dispel another myth, a lot of people think orgasm causes a flood of dopamine. Um, the dopamine that's been measured actually is not associated with climax. It's associated with sexual arousal. And so what that means is there are a lot of things we prescribe to orgasm, like, oh, you got to do, you know, get to climax because you get your dopamine hit or you get your oxytocin that's going to bond you to your partner. You actually don't need it for that. <laughs> like, the main thing orgasm does is uh, we think vasopressin is a somnolent, which means the thing that helps you fall asleep after. <laughs> so uh, it may be that the, the kind of biggest effect of that is to kind of knock you out afterwards, mm -hmm. um, possibly. Uh, these things are very, very poorly studied. We're actively doing a study actually looking at inflammatory markers before and after climax because they've never been studied before. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I would say like th that data could change, um, but there, the oxytocin changes that are often attributed to this bonding, they actually seem a lot more broad than that. It seems to be related to like trust and safety signaling, not just bonding, um, which is probably why it appears to be related to bonding. Uh, but that increases a lot during sexual arousal. You don't need a climax 
to have that benefit or that change. Interesting. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Um, and then, uh, my last question for you, uh, you wrote an article in the daily beast that referenced a study on that having an orgasm has no effect on a person's biometrics. Could you explain what biometrics means specifically? And then, um, what that study indicates? We followed people throughout their entire sexual response, which is what was really rare in that study. Mostly when we study sexual arousal in the lab, we get you aroused for three to five minutes and then we get you out of there. Um, because we're really just interested in that early response. So, uh, what, yeah, it's terrible. We give everyone blue balls and send them home. (laughs) It just sounds like a really bad date. (laughs) Yeah. So it's funny. This is one of the hardest things to get through ethics review uh, is some of our ethics boards won't allow us to have people continue through climax and don't get me started (laughs) down why that might be, but it's difficult to get through review. So we've got to study through review. And we monitored their peripheral physiology and also their brain response. So we looked at something called galvanic skin response, which is a measure of sympathetic nervous system activity, and also their electroencephalography or EEG, which is the brainwave measure we use, and through their entire sexual response. So when they're starting to get aroused um, and we have this computer program that says, okay, you know, stimulate yourself, stop, stimulate yourself, stop. Sometimes we did it with an automated vibrator, um, but other times it was instructed. Um, but the early part, they're just getting aroused. And then we say, okay, okay, that's enough getting aroused. Uh, now try and have a climax. And your only job is if you have a climax, press the big red button beside you when it starts. And of course people forget a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was going to say. Yeah. It's, we, we are not as practiced, uh, humans as the performers are, I think, to monitor our surroundings <laughs> during that time. So um, that was their only job. And what was really remarkable about that is we saw early on what we had seen many times before, that is we get uh, strong alpha suppression and increase in GSR. So what that means is people, when they're trying to become aroused, they're focused, they're trying, there's a lot of effort being exerted to become aroused. You have to pay attention to the things that you're feeling so that your brain elaborates on that. And uh, you develop the fantasy and kind of sexual mindset, we might say. But then we say, okay, now try and have a climax. The first time we saw this happen, we literally thought the instrument had fallen off because we were like, this is not a real response. Nothing changes that drastically in the physiology. And it turns out now we believe it. (laughs) We've seen it enough times. It's uh, been replicated in men and women where the galvanic skin response drops precipitously and the alpha brain waves go up a lot when we tell people to try and have a climax. So how we're interpreting that, which again, new data. We think that to get to a climax, you have to have a sufficient amount of arousal, whatever that is, and then you have to let go. That is, you have to stop trying. You have to stop like exerting this effort and this high focus um, and intentional direction to allow your body to go into that state. And there's another uh, scientist who believes that Uh, orgasm is largely a whole lot of neurons all firing at the same time, um, which might sound familiar to some people as a sign of a seizure. So that's also what happens during seizure activity or ictal activity. And so it, if we tell this story, you know, what we think is happening, it could be that this is not a great state for the brain to be in. You can't really monitor your environment or respond to safety problems, uh, when you're having a climax. And so you want to be sure <laughs> that, that you are ready to have this experience. And that may be part of what's going on, you know, is this uh, particular brain experience is pretty unique. And uh, to get to that place where your brain can go into this gross synchronous firing, you probably need to allow it to do that. That is to reduce some of the inhibition that might normally prevent your brain from going into that state. So. A lot of speculation still, but that's what we had observed so far, is it really seems like there's this unique state that, you know, isn't captured by our current sexual response models. And it's probably because we just don't normally look that long. That makes so much sense. I mean, just from my own personal experience, I definitely had have a much easier time orgasming with men that I feel safe and connected to. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah, well, it's clinically, I love that too, when we started seeing those data, because there are a lot of people that will say like, I get turned on just fine. I'm really attracted to my partner, but I can't get over the hump and I don't know why, you know, and I'm so mm-hmm. in my head about it or the reverse. It's like, I can have a climax just fine, especially when I'm on my own, but you know, starting, starting that engine is a trouble. So it makes sense that those two problems may be dissociated. Like someone may have one and not the other 
if they're really different brain states, because it suggests like a different kind of skill set, if you will. So I, I love that also just for helping clinically, like how are we going to help patients who struggle with this? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely as somebody who has shot like a lot of boy girl porn and has wa have watched men either successfully or struggle to like come on cue, you know, because mm -hmm. you're not allowed to come until we've done all the positions and we've shot the 30 minutes of footage or whatnot. I can tell you that it is definitely a skill set because some guys like struggle to, to do that pop shot and some guys can do it right away. And those are like, mm -hmm. it is amazing to me. It really is that, that guys are able to do that at all. And I actually had a guest, um, a well-known performer who said that he went to a, uh, he was taking too long to come after a scene, you know, and it was mm -hmm. affecting his work and he went to a hypnotherapist who apparently helped him. And now he comes much faster. Huh? Hmm. Yeah. I wonder what they did or what they tried to sensitize that worked for him. Yeah. I don't know, but he says it, he says it worked. So. Uh, Dr. Prousey, thank you so much for coming on. This has been so, so interesting. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I'm always uh, interested to hear what's going on in the industry too, because we, we're following <laughs> and trying to use those stimuli ourselves, and uh, it's helpful for us to be able to use that in our science. Oh, well, I mean, if you ever have need any knowledge um, about the adult <laughs> industry, I, I'm full of it. <laughs> well, there um, you have it. You... Unique knowledge set for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, can you tell everybody where they can find you online, like social media handles, if you have a website? Well, uh, website's probably easiest. It's librocenter.com, L I B E R O S, center, all one word, dot com. And there I've got Twitter handles and all that good stuff. Perfect. And you guys, as always, can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. If you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. If you want to see the work that I do, the scenes that I direct, um, hollyrandall.com. And uh, thank you guys so much for listening or watching whatever platform you're on. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>